Each week we come here on Sunday and we come to uh, worship, we come to be encouraged in our spiritual journeys, um, we come to learn and receive, and if everything works right, we come to, uh, I think, to be uplifted in what we're doing um, with God. And then comes Monday, and Monday can be hard, the whole rest of the week can be hard, right? I mean, there are lots of challenges that we face as we enter into work and the things that occupy um, our week. It reminds me of, uh, I was sharing with some, er- some earlier, but it reminds me a little bit of the story of the uh, Nobel Peace, or sorry, the Nobel winner in physics who had this incredibly difficult nanotechnology thing that he'd come up with at MIT. He won the Nobel Prize and he went around the world uh, giving talks. And when it came time for them to schedule his talks in Europe, he was giving a 30-city tour and they hired a chauffeur to take him from city to city. And so they hired this guy, and they, uh, he began driving him. And the time they got to about the 28th city, this professor was saying, I'm just so worn out, I don't think I'm going to make it. And he got through 28. He got through 29. It was time to do the 30th one. He says, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And the chauffeur says, listen, I've heard all 29 lectures. I got, I got this. Why don't, we, why don't we switch clothes? And I'll give the lecture because, I, I mean, I've got this. So they do this, and the professor's like, yeah, I'm on that. So they go into the lecture hall, and the chauffeur comes up to the mic, and he does a brilliant job, nails it, just knocks it out of the park. Only made one mistake. He finished 10 minutes early. And so the host that evening says, well, we got 10 minutes. Why don't we do some Q&A? <laughs> so this, <clears throat> this one guy comes up to the mic and gives this enormously complicated question. The chauffeur held it together because he sat there looking like he's got this. And uh, when he was done, he kind of even kind of looked disgusted and said, you know, that is such an easy question. I'm going to let my chauffeur answer it. <laughs> and the chauffeur comes to the mic. So, I mean, we all have trials at work, right, of one form or another. And the question is, where are we with what happened on Sunday and what happens on Monday? Sometimes people will ask this, and we ask this question about this. Some people have two different reactions a lot of times. On the one hand, they'll say, yeah, you're right. Um, where is God on Monday at work? How do we c- carry what we've talked about on Sunday into Monday? And there's other people who are very happy to say Sunday's over there and Monday's over here, and I've got to be aggressive on Monday in a way that I don't want to worry about what Christ is telling me. You know, and, I, and I get this. You, know? I mean, you may go on Sunday and hear Jesus talking about being humble and taking the lower seat or whatever else, and you're thinking, if I don't show up and say, I'm God's gift to whatever's going on here at work. People aren't going to respect me or clients aren't going to want to pay for me or whatever else, you know, the deal is. There can be that tension and that conflict with it. And I think that the church for a long time has been silent about how you carry faith into work on Monday and the rest of the week. So much so that uh, sometimes people will talk about it being the Sunday, Monday gap. And I wish I could tell you that this is a brand new problem. This has only happened in the last little bit, but it's not. Some of you will know the Inklings, um, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and all the different group that were these literary scholars and theologians. One of them you don't always hear that much about was Dorothy Sayers, um, one of the uh, women that was in the group. And um, she died in 1957. And before she died, she wrote this. She says, And nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality is in her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. She's allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result, the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and that the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. This idea that there's this, this, this gap this way that takes place. And... Um, What we want to do with the sermon series we're starting today and that we're going to do over the next three weeks is to go into this gap. We want to talk about this divide between Sunday and Monday and how we bring faith into what we do. And as we do it, uh, we're going to look at three different topics over the next three weeks. We want to talk about the worth of work. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. We want to talk about jobs that we love and that we can really get into and then finally, we want to talk about what it means to win at work. What does is, what is success look like for Christians uh, in this context? But today, I want to talk about the worth of work. And I really want to look at two things. I really want to look at 
step back and kind of ask the question, why do we work? And then I want to say a few words about a spirituality of work. Those are two things I want to look at. If you uh, stop and look back at what you do, um, 40% of your life is spent at work. 40% of your life. So, why do we do it? Where's God in it, right? But why do we do it? I think the, the quick answer most of us would jump to first is because there's bills to pay. Um, some others might say, well, it's, it's because I'm trying to get to whatever the next fun thing is. I'm working for the weekend, right? Or we think whatever it is like that, but it's, it's got to be more, right? There has to be more. And part of the Christian answer is yes. We don't say it enough, but yes, there is. And I want to do a little bit of a... a it's terrible to start a sermon this way, but a little bit of apology to say today's sermon might be a little more theological than some of the others and certainly the rest of, of this series. But when we talk about the question from a theological perspective of work, why is it that we work? And the beginning place for us to answer that question is to first look at God and say, because it's God's idea. God is a worker. We have a worker God. And we look, we look at Jesus Majority of his life spent as a carpenter. We think about that. We see Jesus in that image before he starts his public ministry, working day after day with his dad doing carpentry, right? And we think about our gospel lesson today where we hear Jesus talking about how his father is still working. He's getting all this heat because he's worked on a Sabbath healing this guy. And, he, and part of his defense of that and talking with this, he talks about how God is still working. And then we come to um, our first lesson that we had today, and we back up the whole clock and begin to think about the creation story. We think about God creating and all the work he does, and then he rests, right? We think about and where he includes humanity and all of that. Think back about some of this. Um, Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish and the sea. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. If you don't think there's work in subduing it, there's work in that. And have dominion over the fish of the sea. And it was so. And God saw what he'd made, and behold, it was very good. And you know the second chapter's got another variation on the, on the creation story. And in 2 Genesis, we hear how part of the description there talks about the beautiful garden being created. And then we hear how the humans are to till it and keep it. Called, called in to work. And uh, part of this is to recognize that what God has done is the working God has worked in creating the world. And then he's made sacred time of rest. But he's told us he's made us in his image. And in that, he's called us to be like him, to be people who are about work. And many people would say, and I believe, that he's really calling us to partner with him in the ongoing process of creation, that God is continuing to work his will here. He's continuing to create and pour in energy and creativity into the world. And part of his call to us is to participate in that. And get to be involved in that. And there, there are a number of important upshots that I think come out of that. When you stop to think about what God has done. And the first one of these to think about is that work is not simply a, a means to an end. And we oftentimes get that way. Well, I'm working to get to, the, to retirement. I'm working to get my kids to college. I'm working through whatever the deal is. It's not just a means to an end. But it's part of how God's ordained it. He's the working God created us in his image, and he's called us into that. And I think it, it brings a lot of things with it, right? Part of it is, you remember how he creates, and he says, everything he creates, look at that, it's really good. And I think part of what we do is there's, there's a built-in satisfaction to a job well done. There's, there's a built-in satisfaction to work. I don't know if you've ever been given an assignment at work or in school or whatever, and apart from the grade or the review on it, you already have this sense of, satisfaction and accomplishment in it and i think it's part of it's part of it's inherent i think about this sometimes when i look at a guy like warren buffett and you're thinking like if i had that many billions would i be working but it but maybe we're wired that way 
God's made us to be a working people. He's made us to be that way because it's how he's ordained it and called us to, in his image to be like him in working. And I think maybe we find a sense of deep satisfaction in just doing that, right? So I think that's one of the things that we look at in that. And there, there are more upshots that come out of it as well. Not only it, does, it means that we're not working just for the ends, it means that there's a sort of a gift of satisfaction in the work we do. But along with that, there's a dignity that goes with it, right? And, and how things are ordered. One of the encyclicals, you know, that when popes come into office, they'll oftentimes write a letter to the church at large, the Roman Catholic Church, where they'll talk about different things. John Paul, early in his, um, in his papacy, wrote a letter that was called the Encyclical on Work. And one of the things he said in, in this encyclical is that work was made for man. Work was made for man and not man for work. And it may sound really heady and precise and what have you to, to get into this kind of detail, but it matters a lot. Because what it's saying is it's not about the output of what we produce, right? It, but it, there's a dignity that's given by who's doing the work. If you think about it this way, like in, in, in everything at work, there's a subject and an object. There's the one doing the work. There's the work that gets done. And what this is saying is the one doing the work is where all the dignity is. It's about the creation of humanity, and then God gives us work. So all the dignity of it's from the one doing it. And part of what that means is the output is something secondary so christians don't walk around saying oh yeah the person who does some low-level job isn't the same as the ceo their outputs are different society may value those outputs differently but christianity would, would say that the dignity of the workers are the same and that god has given dignity to the actors and then given them work right and it's a big difference and our society has this completely the other way around we we want to we want to size you up by your output what it is you produce. And what do you do? Not who are you. It doesn't matter what you do. You know, I, I've gotten to where I love going on um, trips or different things w with groups where I like to avoid talking about what we do as long as we can. And it's a challenge because people, when they meet, they want to say, what do you do? Because it's, qu it's a quick how we size things up. And I think it becomes really acute when somebody is unemployed. Because one of the things when people are unemployed is they can so, or underemployed, either one, they quickly get to where they feel like their value is at stake. But if, we, if we're true on this message, we, we would never say that. We, our dignity is because of how God's made us and not what we do. And I don't think we say that enough. And society has its own message, which is a different message that we have to hold on to, I think, and, and try to correct Another reason that we work, of course, we have to confess, is to survive. And here we think about, okay, God's created us, the working God called us in his image. But when humanity falls, um, you'll remember that Jesus still, I mean, that God still loves humanity. He sends them out the garden in the, in the story, but tells them they're going to have to sweat. They're going to have to toil to survive. So along with what's gone before, now there's an element of toil. That gets mixed into it all. And sometimes that's where we get to where work can be tough. Sometimes we can get, you know, there's a spectrum between you got the great job where you fully recognize the dignity of it down to the worst job with a lot of toil. And everything is kind of in between it, right? But we have to toil to get by. And St. Paul in writing later uh, in, first, in Second Thessalonians, I think, is it, where he talks to people. Apparently there are people who are able-bodied there who are not working. There's some people there. And he tells them, man, if they're not working, they're not eating. And that's kind of, there's a survival function um, that takes place in all of this, that we've got to work to survive, and that's mixed up into all of this, right, with the toil that we do. And the third reason, which I think is a, is a reason that's hard to labor on too, too long, but there is an element of work that is about refining our character, that God uses the toil and uses the work and uses all these things as something that he uses, I think, to shape us. And to mold us. But a lot, everything we're talking about is a lot more than simply paying the bills, right? There's a lot more going on. Well, all of that is to answer some of the questions about why we work. It's not just to pay the bills. It's not just for the weekend. But what do we do with God in the workplace? Is there more that we can do? I want to turn and, and shift now to the final part and just kind of talk about the spirituality of work for a minute. And one piece of this is to maybe approach work differently. Now, there are some jobs 
I'd be surprised if, if somebody has ones that are just completely out of bounds. But you can imagine a job that is so out of bounds that you're, you're doing something destructive to God's kingdom. That's the rare case, right? Um, for most of us, God calls us into work, and we have work, where we're helping to further order um, the world. We're partnering with Him, in a sense, in ordering the world, enhancing His kingdom. It may be slightly different than just straight on building up the kingdom. We do that in many dimensions, but our work at some level is helping God's kingdom and helping people and helping be more goods in the world for people and what have you. So there's a sense in which we are participating in that. And the more that we can stop and be mindful of that at the workplace, I think the more we'll see a sacredness of our work, not only why we do it, how we get here, but that we're participating with God. And it can change it from just being a job we do to put groceries on the table and pay for the kids or do whatever to being something that we're participating in what God's doing in the kingdom and in the world and, and a piece of that, right, and how we do it. And it can be something that we offer to God. One of the things I see, and I think the Episcopal Church is really bad about this, um, if you ever meet somebody who's had their faith suddenly come alive, like suddenly, they go to a retreat, it's Curcio, it's something, whatever it is, their faith comes alive, very often they'll come out of it and they'll say, ah, oh, I've got to be a priest, and part of what's behind that is we don't have category. We think the only people really doing straight on, full on kingdom work are the people in ministry. But that, that's not right. Every Christian has a vocation. Part of your work is, part, is that calling. There are all kinds of ways that God's calling you to minister where you are. In the fruit of your labor, in the way you do it and the way you interact with people, all of that stuff is, is your vacation. In fact, that's the default. I'll go as far, I don't, know, I don't know what Father Oliver would say on this, but the default is where you are to bless people and to work for the kingdom where you are. That's the default, unless you feel a particular calling later down the road um, to, to do something else that way. But, but seeing that, I think, helps us in living out that sense of vocation where we are. And we're starting stewardship season right now. And, you know, sometimes people don't say it, but I promise you, there are people in this room who God has given you a vocation to make money. And I'm not joking. Because ministry takes money, building up God's kingdom takes money. And there are people that God has blessed with gifts of making money. And you've never seen it that way. He's blessed you in that. And part of your call is to, is to own that. It's part of what you give and how you do to support other people doing different things in ministry. I mean, all of us are called to give, but I'm just saying some people have that particular gift. There are lots of gifts that God has that everybody has some of it, but some people are given a big gift of it. You know, I sometimes think about uh, people in the church who, who have the gift of healing, which is a whole other sermon. But, you, but everybody in the church has got a call to pray for healing. But some people have got this thing where God's really called them and given them passion to pray for it. And you see different things happen with those people. All kinds of gifts are like that. And I think this is, you know, there are lots of these around work, making money, what you do, how you interact with people that, d that does this. So I think we have to see that. And along with that, I think we have to develop a mindfulness as part of our spirituality of work, a mindfulness of seeing God at work. And oftentimes it's in the small things. And the people who say hello to you in a certain way or support you or there are different quiet ways in which you encounter God in the workplace. Um, the, I think the most famous example of this uh, is Brother Lawrence. Um, some of y'all will know him from the 17th century, the monk. He was uh, in France, and his job, he was the monastery cook. And uh, this guy had a special joy in his work, certain chipperness about the pots and pans and cooking and the stuff he did. And over time, he, he developed a reputation where people knew that he was communing with God in work. And eventually uh, the abbot came to him and said, we want you to write about how you do this. And, uh, and he did eventually. He didn't want to, but eventually he did. And he wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. And he talks about, being, about committing your work to God and about being reflective to see God's hand at work in your workplace because he's there. And part of it is slowing down to have the eyes to see God wherever it is that we work. And I th so I think when we talk about the spirituality of work, we're talking about being mindful about why we work and seeing God's hand in how he's created the order. I think we're, we're being mindful of God's presence at work. 
And we're being mindful that our work is part of participating with God and offering to God. And so we commit it to him as we pray while we're, we're, we're at work. Because he's given us, we've made us in his image, the working God, called us into this vocation and work. He's um, called us to work to survive this way, but he's honored in what we do. We commit it to him as a part of our offering and what he does, and he's there. I think the more we do that, we'll see the 40% of our work day, our, our lives, that there's a blessing there, and we shouldn't have this humongous gap between Sunday and Monday. It should be an extension of living out our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us and creating us and making us in your image. We thank you that you've given us dignity, just inherent in the fact that you've made us. You've given us dignity in placing us above um, your created order and called us to participate with you in the ongoing creation. Help us to undertake it as an act of worship and prayer that's submitted to you for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.